about it. Well, what we did is, uh, Sandra and I, we had built, uh, we are building two skipjack models. And as you can see on the drawing, these are 48 inch skipjack models. That's the length of the hull. But the overall length is 5 feet due to the bowsprit, the bowsprit sticking out. The total length is 48 inches, uh, 50, 60 inches, it's 5 feet. Uh, the drawing is not to scale, so you can't really compare the size of the boat to what you see in the drawing. Sandra wanted to build one of these uh, several years ago. She ordered the prints in 1994, and this is now 2002, <laughs> and we just started building them, um, I guess, last fall during the winter and spring and the fall. We keep thinking we'll have them ready to put in the water different holidays, but we ain't made it yet. It's a lot to it. If you look at the drawings, there are basically four drawings to the skipjack, to building the skipjack model. You've got the first, the basic drawing, showing you the, um, the general, showing you the general shape of the boat, what it's supposed to look like and where certain items are supposed to be um, positioned. And then, in addition to that, we have these other drawings, as for example, this drawing. This drawing shows you, shows you how big to build a rudder, and now this is to scale. The rudder is that big. And the bow stem, and I um, can't see for looking. The rudder, rudder mount for the rudder. This goes up against that. This is a lead keel. We are very fortunate. The um, Solomon's Model Yacht Club, Model Club, sells the keels as well as the sail. This is the general shape of the sail. The sail is close to four foot tall and it backs out close to four feet at the foot so it's a pretty good size sail that's the main sail and then the jib the jib is over three feet by four feet by oh, a little less than two feet so it's a good size jib so we were able to buy the sails and we were able to buy the keel and we had to make the rudder and everything else and everything else really we've made except for the sails and the keels and it's been an interesting task <laughs> now, so it's taken quite a while really first thing you have to do is you have to build what they call a building platform this is nothing but a rectangular platform with certain locations to tie the bulkheads that you make so we had to build this platform first, make sure it was square, and these bulkhead locations uh, laid off in the exact location that they're supposed to be, because when you make the frames that are going to go in the boat, the boat is a framed boat, just like a uh, rail boat would be, but when you position the frames, you want to make sure they're in the right spot, otherwise your boat's not going to be shaped right. So we built the building platform, and right now we have it stored overhead. And then we built the frames. Okay. Well, anyway, we built the building platform first, and then we laid off of the frame locations. There are one, two, three, four, five frames, as well as a bow stem, and then a transom. This is the transom board that we had to cut and make and the special support for it at the time. This part of the dry, uh, diagram shows you the bow stem and the outer stem that you have to make. This is the uh, skeg underneath the boat and the long head, which is in the front of the boat up under the uh, bow pulpit. <coughs> okay. uh, this shows you how to how to make the mass, how long to make the mass. The mass is 45, 45 
No, this is the boom. I'm sorry. I was going to think. It's longer than that. The boom is 45, over 45 inches long from one end to the other end. So that's a pretty good size boom. This is the mast. And the mast is 51 inches long. So it's over four feet tall. So when we get through, we're going to have a good sized boat. Anyway, talking about the frames, this is the drawing that they provided us for the frames. And really, this, this is the scale. You make the frames the actual size you see here. So what we did is we made a template. Utilizing this, we made a template, a cardboard template. And then we took the cardboard template and we bought some 3-8 marine plywood, laid the templates on the plywood, and then cut the frames out. And after you cut it out externally, then you go in and you have to cut it out internally. So, so what you've got left is just a wooden frame, a sock. And this is the leg. All this stays on initially because this is the part that gets tied down to that building platform. The whole boat initially is built upside down. Okay, that's the four drawings that we got for building the skip down. It gives you a bill of materials, which is what this is. And these are suggestions, bill of materials. Um, like I said, we bought 3 8 marine grade plywood for the bulkheads, which worked out good. We bought a 4 foot by 8 foot sheet of um, anyway it's eighth inch material they use for building canoes oakium oakium that's what it is a four foot by eight foot sheet of oakium for building it for the uh, for the deck the sides and the bottom we decided to make our own boards is what this is. This is for the keels. You actually have an outer keel, an inner keel, and a top keel board. So there are three of these in each boat. And just about this length. <laughs> Almost. And what we did is we ripped this out of a board that we bought. We bought a board this thickness and we uh, ripped it on the table saw to the thickness we wanted here and the width we wanted here for the keels. This is one inch wide a quarter inch thick. And that worked real well. Real well indeed. We also needed members for the sides of the boat that would bow around, if you can imagine, for the sides, the way the boat would be shaped like that. And we ripped that out of the same board, and the same materials, and that's a quarter inch thick by a little over a half inch, about five eighths in that neighborhood. And in the, in the, um, Places where the board had to do a whole lot of bending and bowing to relieve some of the stress, we took and we made a little saw curve in the wood, which allowed the wood to bend and not be under a lot of stress. To reinforce that, we filled all those saw curves with um, waterproof glue that we used on the whole boat, so to give it strength. Uh, I don't have a boat to show you at that time, what it looked like when we got through. But it was an interesting project. We have, we do have snapshots of the boats as we've built them. We've been working on them a long time. Um, the mast, the booms, not the booms, the mast, the sides of the boat were the uh, rub rails, the tow rail, the deck rails, the bow sprit, all of that's made out of mahogany. And we made that out of this mahogany board right here. It's one large board that uh, we had for a long time, and we ripped the material out of that. This is the mahogany board right up here. I keep it stored up here so it's out of the way and doesn't get cut up for just any, anything. But we were able to rip the material we needed for the mast and, um, and all the other stuff we wanted to build out of mahogany. And speaking of the mast, this is one of the masts right here. I'll lay it down on the drawing so you can see it. Okay. This is one of the masts here that we ripped out of that board. It started to be a one inch by one inch cut of a rectangular board. 
and we wound up tapering it. This would be going up in the air like that. We wound up tapering it simply by filing it. A lot of filing, a lot of filing, and a lot of sanding. To give it that tapered look. And since this is mahogany, it's very light, very light indeed. It's come out well. At the base of the mass, I put a brass collar to give it strength. And the eye screw is for the uh, boom vang part of the boat. We've done a lot of work so far on these. Anyway, that's the mass. I'm going to set that right here. The boom, when we got to making the boom, all it required was a half inch dowel rod. I don't know how you want me to. All it required was a half inch dowel rod. And uh, we tapered the end. And these get white, white paint. The tape hadn't been pulled off yet. And cleats and uh, fittings. And this part, to give you an idea, will go like this. You have the mast here break it back and the boom goes like that. You'll see it later on on the boat. Okay. The jib sail has a little club boom, and that's just made out of quarter inch down rod. Very simple. Piece of quarter inch down rod, kind of straight. Paint the end, put a couple of eye screws in it, and you got it made. <laughs> it's very simple to do. Very simple indeed. I like, like doing that. Um, we have the 4 of 8 sheet. Uh, set of oakium we had for making the sides and the bottoms and the decks on the boats. For building two boats, this is basically all that's left of that 4x8 sheet. Uh, I guess I'm very fortunate that we were able to get two boats out of one sheet because this stuff cost, I think this stuff cost us about $80 for one 4x8 sheet. It's pretty expensive, but it's supposed to be good for the water and when we get through, we don't want these things coming to pieces on us. Uh, too much work, taking too long to have them messed up. Uh, uh, let me see now, what else, what else, what else, what else? Uh, as we built the boats, there are different components that needed to be built. And as you could see on the boom, the brass fittings, I had to make all of the metal fittings that were required to hold the mast up and to hold the sails in place. And the whole works. Well, this is not a kit boat. This is a, a raw boat, period. But all this bag is full of little fittings for the two boats. This little fitting here will go up under the very bottom of the boat in this region here and that's what with a cable going to the bowsprit that's what helps support the bowsprit a little brass all these are made out of brass plate or well they're all brass plate essentially i bent them and soldered them together to make them come up right these little arms are basically for the rudder control servo control and the rudder that will go in place in the back. These fittings are the fittings that are required to help hold the mast up in place. And these are the top of the mast. Remember that has two boats. So that's the reason why you see two of these. One for each boat. And there's another one of these. Ah, let's see. These will go on the uh, bowsprit. These little fittings 
go on the club boom for the jib. These are the hinge pins for the rudder. And these are the mast plates that hold the mast to the deck. And these little plates here, I haven't drilled the holes yet, but these little plates here are the plates that go on the sides of the boat called chain plates. That's what basically holds the mast between these chain plates and the fitting here that goes on the end of the bow pulpit is all that holds the mast up. It's a three, three stay rig essentially is what it is. But that's the metal fittings that were required. We made those now. Also, how do you attach the sail to the mast? Well, you could... There are different methods that different people had used. We chose to use the ring method. As you can see in this bag, there's lots of rings. There's supposed to be enough rings for both boats and one complete spare. So I wanted to have a complete set of spares just in case these rings broke. They're made out of oak, <clears throat> but they're very thin. Very thin material, made out of oak. I cut the initial hole with a hole saw, high speed wood bit rather. And then I was able to lay it out and then I cut the rest on the outside for band saw. And then took the sander and just kept rotating these on the sander until I had the basic shape. And then took a hand file and just hand filed worked them until I got them the way I wanted them. <clears throat> I'm sure there's no two alike since they're all hand done hand made and they've all got a coat of varnish on them <clears throat> actually two or three coats a lot of this stuff was trial and error you get an idea in your head how to do it, you try it. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, you try something else. Until you get it to work. I'll stick all this stuff back in this bag so I don't lose it. I'm almost at a point on the actual boats where I'm ready to start mounting this stuff. As you can see on the boom, I've already mounted the fittings for the boom. I did that today, as a matter of fact. And it's been enjoyable building these because I've been able to use some of the things I learned through the years at work when I was working for a living. Now I'll set them aside. I'll set these aside. Figureheads. We got the idea we, want, we wanted a figurehead on the front of the boat. So, Sandra fixed her a figurehead, and then she asked me, did I want one? I said, oh, what the heck, why not? Well, she wanted to fix a eagle head for the front of her boat. And these are all, once again, you got to realize, all this stuff is handmade. This is her eagle head. A little bit later, I'll stick this on one of the boats and uh, give you an idea roughly what it looks like on the boat. Uh, it's got a groove in it that fits up in the long head. You'll, you'll see that later. They haven't been painted yet. Still got to be done. But this was neat. She, uh, wound up making the model of this out of clay and then making a mold. And then from the mold, it had this epoxy, plastic epoxy mix that you mix up. And uh, pour it in there, and out comes an eagle head. I'll show you that later on on one of the boats. I'll set that aside right now. And I decided, well, what do I want? Well, I want something different. We're building the boats exactly alike. Without certain little things, you'd never know whose boat was whose. So I looked through a book and I finally found something that uh, looked interesting. It's probably overboard. Anyway, Sandra made me this. I chose to have this thing made. Uh, what is it? I don't know, but it looks neat. <laughs> Maybe it's a phoenix. Who knows? 
biggest problem with this right now is I don't know how to paint it. I don't know what color or what the uh, variations would be. This also has a slot in it that goes up in the long head. This is basically what the front of a long head looks like. And it fits up in there like that. I did this on purpose just to give these wings some support so they don't get broke while it's stuck in storage. Anyway, we'll put that on the front of the boat in a little bit and you'll see what that looks like. I'm sure they look better when you actually see them on the boat compared to what they are now. Uh, this bag. As we build things, we try to wrap them up if we don't need them at the time and put them away so we don't damage them further. This bag contains the rudders. We have two rudders, actually, one for each boat. And I'm having difficulty. There we go. This is a rudder. And this is the controls for the rudder where the uh, goes to the servos and the hinge points. It's a nice size rudder for the skipjack model. It does a pretty good job. This is made out of oak. We cut it out according to the pattern we had, and, and then we basically sanded and filed it down to where we can get a real smooth edge here, a real sharp edge, trailing edge. So we'll go through the water nice, we hope. We do hope to race these boats with other boats that people have made, so we're trying to make things as aerodynamically as possible to go through the water. thing to do would be really to bring out one of the boats so you can see what one of the boats look like. Stick that there. I will go get one of the boats. Well, as you can see, uh, we've gone a long ways. To be honest with you, probably within another week, they'd be ready to sail. Hope so, anyway. But, all of this is the oakium that I told you about. The deck, the sides, and the bottom. It's all made out of the same stuff. All of this is mahogany. It goes around here, all the way around. Tops of the cabins are oakium stained. This is the wheelhouse. This is the cabin where people would normally have bunks, a little kitchen, a little stove or something to cook on. This area is nothing but where they would normally store their oysters or watermelons or whatever it is, cargo that they would carry in the actual boat. Um, these boats were used extensively in the early 1900s on the Chesapeake Bay. They used for carrying cargo, freight, and for horsing. They have very little draft. The actual boats have a centerboard that you could drop, so they could they could sail in very shallow water, which is great for doing the oysters. Uh, the models, these models. <coughs> Because we're going to sail them with a remote control. They don't have a centerboard, they have that lead keel that you already know about that, that we were able to buy, purchase. So the lead keel is always down on this boat here. The bow sprit's made out of mahogany. Um, as I had mentioned before, the mast is made out of mahogany, and you probably won't be able to see all this, but to some perspective, that's where the mast goes. And this is where the boom goes. So that gives you a rough idea of how big the mainsail is. Pretty good size. Yep, it's going to be a pretty good size. 
be interesting to see ad sales. And then, of course, part of the main sale is the jib. And the jib will wind up being like this. Be that size. And it goes up here. Pretty good size. I look forward to trying them. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. No matter what happens, I'm sure we'll enjoy them. These boats have got several, several coats of uh, paint on them. Because we want to seal them up good and not have them leak. It was fun making them. It has been fun making them, but it has been a lot of work, too. The hatches do come off. And this is where the sail drive mechanism goes. And this one comes off. And this is where the electronics board goes. And this comes off. And this is where the rudder servo goes. Remember that you got a rudder that will hang back here in this position back here. And the rudder servo sets in here and is able to turn the rudder left and right. The sail board that goes down in this hole basically is made up of a power for the batteries. These are D-sized batteries, and these are totally for the sail drive mechanism. But also on this slot is a um, AA battery bank. That's for the receiver unit in the boat, and right here is where the receiver unit will go. And all of that. Anyway, the uh, electronics board, that's all it consists of, and it, it will wind up going down in here. And it's kind of difficult for me to get it in from this position. I almost have to be where I can see it real well. But it goes down inside, and all the batteries wind up getting way in the back. And the little latch latches in place, and that takes care of that, so forth. That puts the weight in the back because what we've been told about these models is if you get a good blow going, it forces the bow down. And you want to keep the bow up as much as possible, so I'm shifting all of my weight that I can in the back. Now, the sail drive that goes in here, that's what controls your jib sail and your main sail. And that's what this is. This is the sail drive mechanism. It has a little DC motor couple of limit switches that cut the motor on and off in its maximum travel with a servo that operates a switch that activates the motor clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on which way you want it to go at the time. If you turn it over, you can see in here, maybe you can see, but it's all geared up. So this little old motor, by going through these multiple gears, one, two, three, that's four gears. By going through these multiple gears, makes it real strong at this end. Not a whole lot of torque here, lots of torque here. Which is what you need when the wind blows hard. You've got to have a lot of torque in order to hold that mainsail. Turning it all the way over, you can see the sail on. This is what we call the sail on line will go from your mainsail boom as well as from your jib boom one line will go feed through this hole and the jib boom line will feed through this hole so when it rolls when this pivots one way or the other it will either pull in the line or let out the line and the same thing here if this rotates this way to pull in the main this winds up rotating this way and it pulls in the jib so that way when you do one, you're doing both of them. You're pulling them both in or you're letting them both out. This whole mechanism goes in the hatchway in this hatch. 
just like so. Let me get this up out of the way. And this is another one of these things that uh, is right on the hairy beam. Almost there now. There we go. Take my glasses off so I can see. Uh huh. Since I painted these a little bit tight, so I'm gonna wind up having to take those off a little bit. Anyway, this pushes down like that. That locks in. I gotta lock it this in. that locks in. That holds that real strong. It can't come out, it can't go down, and it can't twist left to right. So when we operate this, it, it'll hold real good. I need to trim that off a little bit. And then, when you got all this on, as well as all of this, you turn on the switch here, you can wind up, you put this back on, this back on and if you got your mass up and the sails attached and everything's ready set her in the water and let the wind take her out and hopefully you got some control <laughs> hopefully process now of laying off of the water line. Let me tilt her over this way a little bit. Drop this down. Now, gotta make the water line around here and this boat will get a real dark red burgundy color water line. Uh, Sandra's boat is going to get a teal green color water line. That way we won't forget who's is who's. Uh, if we're racing, we'll know which one is which and not get them confused since they're made so much alike. Now, I mentioned earlier about the uh, bow sprits and the figurehead. Sandra's figurehead, like I said, she made uh, an eagle head. And it will wind up on her boat. It will go right up in here just like that. So when you get through, whoops, that's what you'll have. And you gotta realize it still needs to be painted. It hasn't been painted yet. I'm having a hard time holding this and holding the boat. There we go. So her figurehead will look like that. And we also, we don't, I don't have them here, but we have name boards. There's a board that goes from here over to here, and on it will be a name. All skipjacks had names. Generally, they were wives' names or mothers' names, something like that. And then this is my figurehead. And it will go like that. And of course, it too needs to be painted. That's what the two figureheads will look like. And I don't know uh, what else I can tell you at this point. Like I say, within a week, I hope to set them in the water. Hope we're able to set them down in the water and try them out. Hopefully they won't leak. There's some miscellaneous items, small items that still need to be done. They don't keep us from going in the water, but they do keep us from claiming the project is finished. This could be one of these projects that should never get finished, I'm not sure. 
but the um, the wheelhouse that's the house back here this little house goes down here like that and what we have to go on that house is a little wheel like the rail boats have that's where a guy would stand back here and he would turn the wheel to guide the boat as it went, um, as it traveled through the water. And what we have done is have done two things, really. I've tried to make a wheel, and I'm not really satisfied with what I got here. I, I may use it, and I may not. It depends on how well I can get it straight and make it look decent. But that would go, if I used it, it would go right here like that. And it's strictly decorative. It won't have anything to do with the actual control of the boat. But it's just to make it look more like um, the real boats were. So that's that wheel. And if I don't use this wheel, then what we have is we were able to pick up some brass wheels and I might use it. Now, it's smaller if you can imagine with me holding it there it's kind of hard to see. It's smaller than the one I made but it might work. I haven't decided yet what I want to do and I don't know what Sandra wants to do on her boat either. If I could get the one I made looking decent I think that's the one I would use simply because it's it's something else handmade for the boats. Because everything we've done on them is handmade. The portholes. You can see the two portholes in the cabin. Well, <laughs> they are made out of a brass ring filled with the uh, epoxy uh, resin. And that worked out real well because if you look at it real close, you can see the brass as an outer rim, like a, a rail porthole, a brass porthole would be. And uh, the resin is glued in there and it's set up in there so there's no way water can get in. So it, it worked out well. I enjoyed making that. It's like I said before, a lot of times you experiment with things. You try something, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, you try something else. Uh, and I've done a lot of that on this boat. Trying other things, that is. But it's a learning process. But I venture to say, if I were to build another one, it would still take me just as long, because it's a lot to building these things. They're not something that you can just build real quick. Uh, one of the guys that we have talked to on the email system about building these made the statement that it took him three years to build his. And he said he was retired and it took him three years. Uh, we've gotten information from another person that built one and it took him two and a half years. So, I know it's relative to how much time you put in them, but still it takes a long time. And you got to realize we're building two of these. There's another one in the front garage in the house that's at the same position this one is. Just like this. As, as we're building them, if I did something to one of them, if we did something to one of them, we did the same thing to the next one. That way we, we built two side by side at the same time.
just sat and think of something. This is an example of the, the two colored paints we're going to use for the water lines. Uh, I had to run a test piece. I had to know whether the paint that I wanted to use, this burgundy for a water line, as well as the paint Sandra wants to use, the teal for her water line, whether it, either one of these paints would attack the white paint. Because as you can see, the hull's already painted white. And it's painted with this color white paint. So we used this as a test piece. We painted some of the burgundy on it, and we painted some of the steel on it to find out whether it was going to attack it, whether it would bubble in, in orange peel or whatever. And as it looks, neither one of the paints seemed to attack the white. So it should be safe to put on the boats. With the, knowing this, we would have to do this before we um, try to paint the water line. But that's, that's going to be the two colors of the two water lines. One boat will be burgundy, and the other boat at the bottom will be uh, teal. Plus, each one of them will have a gold stripe right at the top. A boot, boot stripe, they call it. And uh, we're going to use tape for that. We got some tape. Wouldn't even attempt to do that by hand. Most of the work's been done out here in this garage. The vast majority of the work's been done out here in this garage. Uh, you got to have something like this to be able to build these things. You just can't. You just can't start building something like this in a house or on a porch because you wind up getting stuff everywhere. You got boards and lumber and sawdust, and, <laughs> and you can't. There are stages when you you built something, you put it together, and it's gluing, but you can't touch it. You don't want to touch it. You need to leave it alone. So it has to have some place like this that's away from the house, where you can just let it stay and set up for 24 hours before you can touch it. And that's about it. This is now July. Tomorrow will be August 1st. We started on these. I'm not even sure when we started. I can find out. I'll go look and see what the bill of materials was. I guess we've been working on seven, eight months. But seven, eight months for two boats is not bad when we know of two people that took them close to three years to build one. So that's not bad. 